Um, if we're going to talk about incentives, we talked about the incentives for reckless driving, we talked about the incentives for murder and other crimes, uh, but the really big one when you're talking about incentives is always taxes. Nothing screws up incentives like taxes. All taxes distort incentives, but some taxes are more distorting than others, and it is often good policy to try to replace the worst taxes with taxes that are somewhat less bad. The worst taxes in many ways are taxes on capital income. I know I harped on this a few days ago, but I want to say it again and I want to illustrate it in a slightly different way. Here are three hardworking people. Uh, their names are Mo and Larry and Curly. And one day they all went to work and each one of them earned $2. Um, that's Moe's two, Larry's two, Curly's two are spread out across the screen, but that doesn't mean anything. They each, they each earned $2. They lived in a world where the income tax rate was 50%. So the first thing that happened was each one of them lost a dollar to the income tax. Left them with one dollar each. Moe spent his dollar to buy two oranges at 50 cents each. Larry spent his dollar to buy four Oreos at 25 cents each. What did the tax cost them? What did they give up as a result of the income tax they paid? If it hadn't been for the income tax, Mo could have bought twice as many oranges. Larry could have bought twice as many Oreos. So the burden of the tax was that it cost them each 50% of their consumption. Okay? I, 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 I hate to use numbers, but I hope those numbers were not too difficult to follow. The tax, the 50% income tax, costs them each 50% of their consumption. Now, an insane person could come along and say, hey, wait a minute, that's not fair. Mo got to buy two things. Larry got to buy four things. Larry should pay an extra tax. Hmm? But we all see that that's silly, right? They each had the same options. One of them chose the two oranges. One of them chose to buy the four Oreos. There's no, there's no reason in efficiency, and there's no reason in fairness why you would want to now levy an extra tax on Larry because he got more stuff in some sense. Keep that in mind. Curly, he likes oranges too, but what he bought with his dollar is four future oranges. The way he accomplished that was he lent his dollar at interest, waited for it to double, and then bought four oranges with it. Four future oranges is just another good, like four Oreos is another good. Okay. He made a different choice about spending, how to spend his dollar. What did the income tax cost him? Well, if it hadn't been for the income tax, he would have had another dollar, which he could have uh, uh, used to buy another four future oranges. The income tax cost him half his consumption. Tax burden, 50%. Everybody has been cost 50% by the income tax. But now an insane person comes along and says, hey, Mo got two things, Curly got four things. Curly should pay an extra tax. He should pay a tax on that interest that he earned. Let's take one of those oranges away. This tax has not cost Curly half his consumption. It's cost him 62.5% of his consumption, five oranges out of eight. Without the tax on interest, before you tax interest, I'm going backward here, before you tax interest, the wage tax already treats everybody equally. It doesn't matter whether you spend your money now or whether you spend your money in the future after having earned interest on it. The wage tax by itself cuts your consumption in half. That treats everyone equally. You slap an interest tax on top of that, you're not treating everybody equally anymore. You're punishing the person who decided to buy four oranges, which makes as little sense as punishing the person, four future oranges, as, which makes as little sense as punishing the person who decided to buy four Oreos. This is bad. It's bad, I'm, go back to, to ju just the first two guys. Why would you not want to tax Larry at a different rate than Mo? Because, if you tax the Oreo eaters at a higher rate than the orange eaters, then some Oreo lovers 
are going to eat oranges just to avoid the tax. And that's a bad outcome. We're, we're encouraging people to do the stuff they don't really want to do. And vice versa. If you taxed the orange eaters at a higher rate than the Oreo eaters, some orange lovers would eat Oreos just to avoid the tax. We don't want to have people doing things they don't want to do just to avoid taxes. That's a bad outcome. Well, that's what we're doing when we tax interest. Some people, like Mo, prefer to spend their money right away. Some people, like Curly, prefer to spend their money in the future. We're saying, if you're like Mo, we'll take half your consumption. If you're like Curly, we'll take 62.5%. That gives people an incentive to consume in the present like Mo, even when they would prefer to consume in the future like Curly. And that's a bad outcome. That's not a good aspect of the tax system. Okay? That's why taxes on interest are objectionable. Taxes on dividends for the same reason. Taxes on capital gains for the same reason. Um, the basic principle is that to minimize distortions, a distortion means encouraging somebody to do something that wasn't what he really wanted to do. To minimize distortions, you want to tax everything at the same rate. That's a fundamental principle of economics. We want to tax everything at the same rate. That means in particular that we want to tax future consumption and present consumption at the same rate. We want to tax those at the same rate. The only way you can do that is by setting the tax on capital income to zero. That observation was first made by uh, Ken Judd and Chris Chamley at Stanford and Harvard uh, in the 1970s, or 1980s, excuse me, mid-1980s, and it has come, as I said the other day, to permeate the literature of public finance. It is a commonplace observation now among economists who write about public finance. Bob Lucas, who is, to my mind, the greatest economist of the 20th century, said this, when I left graduate school in 1963, I believed the single most desirable change in the US tax structure would be the taxation of capital gains as ordinary income. I now, and now means post Chamley Judd, believe that neither capital gains nor any of the income from capital should be taxed at all. My earlier view was based on what I viewed as the best available economic analysis, but of course, I think my current view is based on better analysis. I hate to harp on this one issue for too long, but if you'll bear with me, I'd like to show you how destructive it can be to tax capital via a little fable. I love fables. Once upon a time, a man earned a dollar. He bought a share of stock. The stock price doubled. So he sold his share for $2, which his children inherited. They invested that $2 in a stock that paid a 10% dividend, which gave them an income of 20 cents a year and they used that 20 cents to buy goods and services. Now, you can argue that maybe this guy could have used a, a better financial advisor. Maybe he shouldn't have sold that share before he died, stuff like that. Okay? But this is not an unreasonable sequence of financial transactions. This is a sequence that you can imagine a real person going through. This guy, though, this isn't the whole story, because this guy lived in a world where income was taxed at 50%. 50%. Well, that sounds high, but maybe fair. You know, maybe that's going to cut his children's income in half. Let's see if that's true. Let's retell the story. A man earns a dollar. He pays 50% income tax. Okay. Boom. Right there, that's going to cut every number in half for the rest of the story. His kids are now going to have 10 cents to spend on goods and services. Right there. If he pays half 50% income tax, every succeeding number in the story is cut in half. Bottom line is the kids have 10 cents to spend on goods and services. We have taxed the kids at their entire lifetime future income from this at 50% already up front. But of course, the taxing authorities are not done. He buys a half a share of stock because he's, uh, we've taken half his money. The stock price doubles to $2. He sells his share for his half share for $1, and he pays a tax on the capital gain. I'm going to assume it's a pretty low tax on the capital gain, just 10%. He pays a 10% tax on the capital gain. His children now are going to inherit not a dollar, but 90 cents. His children inherit 90 cents. Of course, they pay about a 50 cent inheritance tax on that, which leaves them with 40. OK, they've got 40 cents. They're going to take that 40 cents. They're going to invest it in a stock that pays a 10% dividend. 
They invest the 40 cents in a stock that pays, uh-oh, not a 10% dividend because now we're in a world with taxes and due to corporate taxes, they're paying a 5% dividend. 5% of 40 cents is 2 cents. So now the children have 2 cents a year in dividends, not 20. But of course, they pay a tax on that dividend income. So now they've got one cent a year after paying the dividend tax. That gives them one cent a year, which they can spend on goods and services, except for the part that they put aside to pay the sales taxes. <laughs> Bottom line is that somehow, because we lived in a world where the tax rate is 50% on most kinds of income, the kid's income was reduced from 20 cents to one cent. That's an effective tax rate of over 95% after you account for the sales taxes there. That's an effective sales tax. And what are the legislators going to say? Hey, we're not taxing you at 95%. We're taxing you at 50%. In fact, we gave you a break on the capital gain. We only took 10% of that. We're taking 50% of your income, 10% on the capital gain. That's all we're taking. It's not true. They're taking 95%. There seems to be widespread understanding in this country, at least among a certain type of people, that taxing corporate income and then taxing dividends is double taxation. What seems to be much less well understood is that taxing wages and then taxing dividends is double taxation. Because the instant I take something out of your wages, I'm taking something out of your future dividend stream forever. That's money that you don't have to earn dividends on. And then when I tax those dividends, I'm taking more. And when I tax interest, I'm taking more. And when I tax capital gains, I'm taking more. The upshot of all this, I mean, I think there are all kinds of fairness issues here. There are all kinds of honesty issues here. These people would have been better off if instead of taxing th this and this and this and this, they would have been better off if the government had just taken 95% of the first dollar right up front. If they had just taken 95% of the dollar right up front, the kids would be in exactly the situation that they are now. But that would be better. It would be better because you would not simultaneously be encouraging people to try to spend their money up front even when they don't want to in order to avoid all those future taxes. Here, I, I, left the, I assumed these people continue to save and spend in the future. The bad outcome is if they spend their money up front in order to avoid these taxes. It would be better, I hate to say it, but it would be better to massively raise the tax on wages and get rid of all these other taxes. You would do less harm. You would do less harm. <laughs>